Jail Doug, one of the critiques of the kind of work you do searching for extraterrestrial intelligence is that if there were such, we'd see evidence of it. Now, when you first hear that argument, it seems obviously wrong. The universe is so big, and you'd see everything. But then you're confronted with some analysis which has to do with the growth of technology. And when you build into that the exponential growth of technology and, and, and just to carry forward what we've achieved ourselves in the last 100 years, projected forward, under the same reasonable exponential growth, and then look at the time available in our own galaxy, the life of suns and stars and planets, you begin to, the, the argument begins to take a little weight that if there were even one extraterrestrial intelligence civilization that we'd see some kind of evidence for it. Now, there are a whole series of counter-arguments to that and back and forth. The, the exercise itself, to me, is, is very probative uh, of a deep understanding of what you do and the importance for humanity. So let's discuss it a little bit. What are some of the arguments against the argument that I just gave you? Well, many of the arguments can be classified as um, they're staying home living the good life because energy requirements uh, don't make it financially or aesthetically or any other motivation to drive them to actually fulfill this colonization picture. Um, perhaps, and, and, and the colonization uh, is, is an exponential in itself. Um, maybe the exponential saturates. You can, you can run numerical models and you'll find that even with a, a number of different seeds, a number of different places where this colonization begins and one colony begets more and more, that there are still islands, pockets, that don't happen to get visited. Maybe we're one of those. Uh, it, it, the, um, the, I'm not really persuaded <coughs> that we yet know enough to say they're not here, so they never were, so let's not bother to search. I think we need to beware of um, thinking perhaps we know too much. And making that statement that they're not here, I think actually is uh, a misrepresentation of what we know about our local universe. We don't know that they're not here. We can probably rule out big, bright, shiny things, spacecraft, but we can't rule out nanoprobes. We can't rule out um, von Neumann machines that have been sent um, but haven't decided to uh, draw attention to themselves. And we can't rule out the possibility that uh, extraterrestrials may have very different motivations than we do. So that when we posit colonizing civilizations, that may be a reflection of what we would do if we had the capability. Now again, the argument, um, perhaps uh, all it takes is one civilization to do that, um, can be a compelling argument if you view all civilizations in the galaxy as independent of one another. And again, that's possible. But perhaps there is a coordination between civilizations, at least in particular areas. You know, one of the explanations for why no one is here is that the Earth is sort of a, a wildlife preserve, <laughs> uh, that, that we're under quarantine, or that, that there may be, well, someone out there, um, but they are not making themselves known, uh, that it's very intentional not to. Uh, when I talk with some colleagues from other countries, they say maybe extraterrestrials uh, don't uh, act like Americans to assume that we want to make contact. And maybe um, they're waiting for us to initiate contact. You know, the way we are doing our search in SETI is to look for transmissions from other civilizations. It's a strategy that allows us potentially to succeed in the coming months, the coming years. Um, but it's possible that everyone is simply holding back and waiting for someone else to take the initiative. Um, and so it may be that if we search for hundreds or thousands of years and we don't detect anything, that's a time to start more active transmissions. So you would wait that long before active transmissions on our part? I would uh, suggest on a very small scale, we actually start at least some symbolic transmissions. You know, sometimes people say, oh, we shouldn't be transmitting because it's dangerous. Maybe other civilizations will want to come and take us over. I don't think we're going to be very good slave labor. You know, our proteins are going to be incompatible with theirs, so we don't have to, to worry about being lunch for ET. 
Um, but I do think that even the symbolic transmission from 1974 from the Arecibo radio telescope to show that we have the capability of transmitting with other civilizations in the galaxy, the messages that we sent out on the Voyager and Pioneer plaques were very important, even though they're very unlikely to be detected, because they start preparing us to think about what we would say if we actually do detect another civilization. And we start really thinking about some of the challenges of making contact with other civilizations. Phil Morrison, um, a very wonderful physicist that we, we lost recently, um, had, had a, a way of looking at this. And um, he suggested that when we think of colonization, we really think of going there, grabbing land for king and country, uh, being very visible. Um, he suggested that perhaps there is only one great prohibitory, prohibitory code in the galaxy, which is that you do not send out self-replicating devices to turn everything into models of yourself, because then you destroy the most important thing in the galaxy. Potential which for is, diversity. That's it. Um, but, ev but the argument is founded on that everyone has to subscribe to that philosophy. Because if, if, if someone, and if again, some civilization doesn't, it, 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 it ruins the total. I mean, it's not a majority have to do that. It's everyone. That's right. And if there are many civilizations that are independently acting, then why doesn't one of them get through? That would be the question that you ask. Right. But again, it's possible that we need to be thinking about more advanced civilizations in different terms. That maybe there is a cooperation between civilizations that even if some civilizations may be motivated to make that contact, that there's some sort of prohib prohibition. So it's like a united federation and that if someone goes outside of that and if you want to directive, take this, if you want you to take the zapped. if you want to take the Star Trek okay. uh, analogy further, maybe they obey the prime directive, right. which is don't communicate with a less advanced civilization unless they make the first effort. Well, well certainly there is a uh, a, a logic uh, that we 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 think is 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 an assumptive certainty that that all intelligence would have. A technology that all technology becomes exponential. The exponential technology continues, and that there is a an, an innate sense if if you make those steps that you must and you will explore. And you, I mean, you have to. All of those steps we're assuming uh, is necessary. And then when we project that forward, and then do the analysis, then that's why we wonder where are they. And it may be that any one of those steps. And it may be that some of those same characteristics of being an exploratory species um, may actually work against the lifetime of a civilization. It may be that civilizations who are able to curb their desire to go outward and conquer other civilizations are the ones that may be around long enough to make contact by other more conservative means. What about the and, argument that you hear sometime about uh, civilizations when they get to a certain point, in fact, we're getting there, that virtual reality becomes more exciting than real reality. And, and eventually then, if we have intelligent civilizations out there, we'll have them creating virtual worlds and virtual universes, and there will be more simulations than there are the real thing. And the, uh, then the key, I would think, the prize would be to go find the real ones and not destroy what's unique about them. Um, Murray Gelman is, is very well known for many things, but he had once uh, talked about the, the simulation uh, versus reality as being like the difference between math and physics or the difference between masturbation and sex. And, and we, we as a species, an intelligent, curious, exploratory species, do seem to prefer the sex part of it, the, the reality. So. I, you can I put that on your plaque and send that out into the universe. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but perhaps if the virtual reality is sufficiently rich and if we can make contact with other worlds through an immersion in their virtual realities, mm. maybe that accomplishes the same thing, but it's a much cheaper and much faster. Uh, a sociologist at the National Science Foundation, Bill Bainbridge, has suggested, in fact, we should think of interstellar messages as sending avatars to other worlds, and those would be our ambassadors. So we may accomplish it, what could happen through a physical contact, 
But we don't have to wait for the probe to get there and then send the response back over a much longer time period. So SETI is just second life for some other That's ET. right, that's right. <laughs> Well, what to me is, is so exciting is that the more you push yourselves in your thinking, the more you expand your horizons, because whatever we're going to find, the history and astronomy and cosmology, just without any life forms, is so, is so rich with surprise mm -hmm. that it is, it is incredibly uh, unlikely that if uh, the area of biggest surprise, which is intelligence forms, conforms to our way of thinking. I mean, one would, should expect surprise in that area. So the more we're thinking differently and forcing each other to, to deal with uh, this uh, question of, of, of what they would be like, why we don't see them, and, and looking for alternatives will make us more receptive and more, more communicative if and when we find something. I'd hope so. But we, have a, we do have a, a long history of still seeing ourselves as the pinnacle of a, an infinite ascent and... and maybe not being as open-minded as we should be. And what, what are the implications of that? Well, I think we mi uh, the obvious implications is we miss opportunities. We miss discoveries. We, uh, we're so focused on finding a solution that fits our preconceived notion that we miss the totally orthogonal solution or reality. Uh, and that is very serious at, at this time, not just because of the, the trauma in today's world that we find, but because the desperate desire that we all feel to, to want to know what's real and to, and to, and to have uh, um, a, a civilizations that are, that are grounded in, in what's fundamental in, in the universe. I mean, everybody strives for that. And if there are ways of thinking that, that inhibit that ability to apprehend reality, that's a travesty. Well, in fact, we may be in the universe created by a future biological, uh, highly technological civilization who ends up putting their own purpose on the universe, having we may be going into the next biological phase of the evolution of the cosmos, where in fact, Intelligence does uh, does in, uh, d does uh, manifest itself by what it does to the universe. That is, it, it has the ability to control the universe itself, and we're in a universe already being controlled by another intelligence. So there you are, working the equipment, the technologies, figuring out new ways to assess uh, and how we can be listening for extraterrestrial intelligence. And meanwhile, all around you, there's this philosophical arguments going on. There are no aliens, and here are the reason. Or there, how, how does it make you feel when you're you're trying to do the the real work of getting the data? And there are a lot of people arguing back and forth with uh, a lot of theoretical stuff. Well, I, I'm very comfortable with uh, the position that we really shouldn't take ourselves too seriously and be very dogmatic about what we know because we may be proven wrong. And so I think it's really worth pursuing this opportunity. Um, we may be, it's been suggested that there is another phase of evolution of the universe, and that's the, the biocosm, the place, the time when intelligence which developed long before we got here um, has so expanded, has followed the exponential, has managed to uh, manipulate energy sources so that it is now having an influence on the cosmos. And so maybe it isn't gravity and, and, and dark energy that is determining the fate of the cosmos right now, but an earlier intelligence who could, in fact, be considered God, that's what some people might say, or simply um, the next phase of evolution of this cosmos. And I think we should not give up a search because we can make arguments that says no one else is out there or we are the first uh, along a very narrow set of criteria. If you would try to project a uh, long time into the future, the human race going on for tens or hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and if you could look back, how important do you think the work that you and SETI do, do today 
would be viewed with that long view of history? I think taking a long view and looking back, we would see this period of time and, and see the most essential aspect as being the period at which we go from trying to answer a fundamental question by asking the priests and the philosophers what they believe to try and answer the question by doing experiments and observations.